гарна традиція на багатьох конференціях мати а, такий а, виступ від, як він називається, keynote lecture, або якийсь інший спосіб виступу, виступ, виступ від дослідника, який є експертом теми конференції і може запропонувати учасникам певні а, рамки, ідеї, як їм рухати в своїх темах, як їм а, а, працювати а, своїми дослідженнями. А, Лекція відбуватиметься англійською мовою. Питання, я думаю, можу ставити українською, російською. Доктор Гухмайстер розуміє наші мови. Тобто, якщо у когось буде проблема з англійською, не соромтеся питати іншими мовами. So, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Alexis Hofmeister. Um, Alexis Hofmeister is uh, wor working for the Basel University um, uh, as a researcher and uh, lecturer. Um, uh, he, his area of research is mainly Jewish and imperial history of uh, Eastern Europe. Uh, his uh, PhD thesis and uh, book, uh, I should say well-known book, uh, was uh, <coughs> about uh, the imperial Odessa and Jewish community in imperial city in, in the uh, late 19th, early 20th century. And uh, we are really grateful that uh, Dr. Meister agreed to uh, come here because from uh, Munich it's uh, a long road and uh, um, we are grateful that uh, Dr. Hofmeister come here and will help us to uh, make here more productive work, more productive discussions, uh, and uh, we'll comment your papers uh, uh, tomorrow and uh, uh, on the next day, uh, next days of the conference. Uh, today the talk uh, will be about uh, four cities: uh, Saloniki, Riga, Odessa, and uh, Trieste. And uh, Alexis Hofmeister uh, will present to us some frame how we could uh, work with Ukrainian or Eastern European topics with in, in broader context and uh, with understanding or uh, also analyzing uh, similar or not similar cases from other uh, regions of Europe and I think for a lot, a lot of us it could be very interesting and helpful this way how we could uh, make uh, our Ukrainian or Ukrainian Jewish history more global, more uh, European. So the floor is here. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I just uh, begin with that cover of, uh, of my presentation just uh, to uh, have to give you a, a picture of it. It's called uh, self-organization and uh, how to translate that. Uh, uh, Bourgeoisity in uh, uh, yeah self-organization of bourgeois culture, Jewish uh, social life, and so Jewish sociability in Odessa around 1900. And uh, unfortunately, I haven't published uh, the second important academic uh, book uh, or a second book, better to say. And that's why I would prefer not to be called professor, even if in the American understanding of assistant professor. Um, uh, uh, that, that might, uh, that might uh, do. First of all, I um, traveled a long way, that's, that's, that's true, that's right, but still I'm very happy to be here and I was very happy to be invited. Uh, Artyom uh, established that uh, uh, contact and um, um, it's not, as you can imagine, if I have written about Odessa, the first time that I traveled to Ukrainian lands or to Ukraine, and um, so um, I'm happy that that was another possibility to visit um, Ukraine at that time, even uh, where I have not been before. And I have to thank the organizers, um, the Center for Inter-Ethnic Relations Research in Eastern Europe, which is in, uh, located in Kharkiv, the Mnemonica Center for Studies of Memory, Policy and Public History here. Uh, in, in, the, in the Department of Political Sciences uh, in the State Humanitarian University. And uh, also, uh, I have to say thank you to Dada uh, and to the uh, 
uh, sponsors uh, who also paid my uh, travel. Um, um, if, if it's said that there is somebody uh, giving an academic input and uh, establishing probably a broader frame, I also have to add that that what I want to present to you is not an um, already finished project or is not uh, the idea for another book. It's it's just it just just came out of some reflections on uh, the history of uh, and as it seemed to me the similar and parallel history of these uh, four cities. Um, particularly uh, the Jewish and other minority communities uh, in these cities, even if you don't, if you might uh, say that uh, Jews are not a minority in <laughs> this, um, for instance. So, so what I was going to say is that um, it's not that I'm coming here and just putting something on the table and then saying, okay, a wonderful present, I, I uh, look forward to your comments and to your um, questions and to your arguments about it because that will help me to um, <coughs> rationalize and to um, operate uh, with that um, material. Um, to tell you the truth, I just discussed with students at the University of Basel uh, that was uh, the theme of one of my um, um, seminaries. Uh, so uh, it just came out of, of that academic uh, um, um, academic enterprise and so in a way I'm just continuing <laughs> what I what I uh, want to do today um, first of all I just want to establish what uh, I will speak about and what is my focus and what are the things uh, that are interesting to me and you might say well there are much more things in common or much more things interesting in these four cities and we have the possibility to um, address these issues in the um, discussion. For instance, and that is very important and I was reminded uh, of this fact yesterday uh, in um, discussion with one of the participants, first of all, the memory of, and the history of, of the um, historiography of these four cities, obviously, until today, is another um, um, uh, interesting and sometimes also burning um, issue, but it, that's not my first aim to address, but uh, I will, I will uh, in a way, start with it and then just let it uh, aside, because I will start with uh, some books which recently came out on the history of these four cities and I uh, use them as material to compare. And I will um, say a few words about um, the cooperation between the imperial state and the respective city elites um, and their modernization efforts in all the four cities. I will say a few words about architecture as a representation of ideology and then I will look at um, the four cities in closer detail, but I have to admit that I'm not able to give um, uh, a detailed view of all four cities. Um, I think Odessa will um, uh, be um, much more in the forefront than the other cities. And at the end, I try to present a conclusion to you or a kind of thesis and just an idea to think about it and to integrate. Um, these four <coughs> cases uh, into um, thoughts about Jewish history, but also as um, I was reminded uh, a few moments before, also of course um, into the history of uh, the Ukrainian lands, which in a way are just situated between these four cities, if you, uh, if you want me to say. Um, okay. Um, I just started a nice uh, picture. Uh, oh, this is good. Okay. Um, the appearance of four cities like Riga, Saloniki, Salonika, Trieste, and Odessa was decisively shaped 
by the rapid historical change at the end of the so-called long 19th century. The golden age of port cities um, clearly was the 19th century. The extreme ruptures of the 20th century, which led to a purposeful destruction of cities and their populations on an unprecedented scale, were measured against the earlier and seemingly unstoppable upswing of port cities experienced in the 19th century. And these uh, thoughts also apply to the four cities mentioned here, Riga, Salonika, Trieste, and the rest. Their public and private buildings, if they have survived, um, until today bear the interest of the age of the first globalization, as some call it, and the bygone imperial times. Um, I will not discuss the word imperial now, we can uh, come back to that in the uh, discussion. How I understand it and uh, what is the definition. The revisiting of their history was closely linked with their re-accessibility after the end of the Cold War in Europe, which opened up new vistas. This is also the cause for the resulting boom of the historiogra historiographical literature on these cities, which again is produced in languages once spoken on the street of these cities. Just to mention a few uh, mostly German uh, publications, i just um, show you uh, some uh, titles um, and um, let me just find... Uh, this is a book of Ulrike von Hirschhausen about Riga. It's uh, translated in, uh, I mean, if you translated the title into English, I don't know if it's translated, it might, might have been uh, translated. It's, uh, one could say, the borders of commonality, uh, Germans, Latvians, Russians and Jews in Riga, 1860 to 1914, and she's um, really um, giving each of these four groups um, the same um, um, she is um, uh, dealing with them equally in equally uh, equal uh, long chapters. Um, and Mark Mezar's uh, Salonika uh, City of Ghosts uh, uh, might have uh, not escaped your attention. Uh, this is uh, also an uh, important book, uh, hotly debated also in Greece. It is translated into uh, Greek. Uh, um, um, uh, and I just go back and show you two other titles in German language. Uh, Guido Hausmann's um, PhD uh, dealt also with Odessa and it's called uh, University and uh, uh, Communal or Municipal uh, Society in Odessa, uh, National and uh, Social Self-Organization at the Periphery uh, of the Tsarist Empire. And there's another one. Oh, this is just Hausmann's table of content, and, and this is the book to Trieste, um, written also by a um, scholar from Germany, Regensburg. She, uh, Sabine Ruta teaches there, as Guido uh, Hausmann does. Culture, nation, milieu, uh, social democracy in Trieste before the First World War, but she is uh, doing much more than just uh, social democracy uh, in uh, trying to describe the cultural frame and also um, uh, yeah, the social frame, uh, the, the preconditions for uh, the uh, social democratic um, enterprise in Trieste, which was bilingual, Slovenian and um, Italian. Um, um, she is describing uh, quite a lot of the uh, multifaceted, multifaceted history of uh, this port city. So back to uh, our um, uh, back to our Patjomkin stairs. I just I suggest to speak of a second foundation of these four cities in the period under consideration. That is the um, end of the nineteenth century. If you want me to say the. Uh, um, last quarter of it. Um, 
One can speak of a second foundation of these cities in several aspects. It was a second foundation by the imperial states, for which these cities fulfilled important economic functions, and uh, the states um, usually um, built um, infrastructure uh, um, to, to foster this development. Uh, in the case of Odessa, of course, it was not a second foundation. Odessa, as you all uh, very well know, was founded um, uh, in uh, 1794. And I want, secondly, to emphasize the factor of urban demography too. So in this sense, also, these cities became new cities. Um, to be more precise, the in-migration in all four cities was important and wide-ranging enough to consider them consider them examples of particular port city paradigm of urban development. And this paradigm, we can also discuss this, um, um, has um, some demographic preconditions. And uh, one is that you have a uh, uh, um, high rise of the um, population of these cities. And uh, this rise is uh, generated by in-migration, not by uh, the um, fertility rate. Housing and residential patterns differing between ethnic groups of immigrants and fast economic change contributed to the shaping of the spatial order of these cities. The socio-economic conditions influenced the social fabric of these particular cities and their cityscapes, but they also shaped the respective spheres of cultural reflection and public communication processes in several languages. I hope you won't accuse me of a kind of Marxist oversimplification if I say that the spatial practices in these cities were a result, um, I would claim at least uh, uh, um, a part, uh, partly uh, resulting um, from the dominating trends of global or transnational and transimperial socio-economic development. So let me introduce the organization of the space, or if you want me to say the spatial order in each of the four cities, with a very simplifying semi semi-circular or circular model, which basically consists of three radial zones. There is always a core at the very center of the city, often open towards the sea, with private and public municipal or state buildings, both of them represented representatively in shape and appearance. Secondly, there is a larger central area beyond the core, which could be understood in terms of its function for the city as an extended center. Important parts of central infrastructure of the cities are located here. Finally, and there is a periphery where the majority of the industrial or more common in port cities commercial and trading enterprises are located. The affluent elites with a more or less cosmopolitan outlook would prefer and could afford to live and work at the center with summer and weekend houses in the countryside beyond the peripheral zone. The middle classes would rather gather in the extended center depending on their financial possibilities, which sometimes only allow a living, allowed a living at the margins. However, striving, up, striving to upward social mobility, they were culturally oriented towards the city center. The workers Finally, including industrial as well as seasonal um, workers and newly arrived in migrants live usually at the periphery in close proximity of, to their places of work, as for example the port facilities or industrial plants and factories. I am aware that this spatial model needs to be adapted to each of the four cities under consideration here, and I will show you the respective city maps uh, later. And it cannot be applied in all cases without minor changes. For instance, the rate of industrialization in the case of Saloniki was much lower than in the case of, uh, let's say, Riga or Trieste. However, um, this model should not lead us to think that we are speaking of uh, completely segregated cityscapes, be it ethnically or socially. There were, of course, mixed spaces, typically for port cities like, forgive me this example, uh, the not so few brothers. Also, the relation between domestic servants and their masters was usually a relation between persons from completely different social worlds and of different cultures too. 
Latvian uh, maids living in Baltic German households in Riga are one example. Uh, on the other hand, the common occupation played a role. Industrial workers who in Odessa gathered at the railway workshops came from the same ethnic, mostly Russian or Ukrainian background, and had roots in the same geographical regions. In the garment industry, to name just one example for companies with a smaller size, the majority of the workforce were Jews. The same could be said about the mostly Jewish tobacco workers in Salonika. Segregation along the lines of cultural and linguistic differences was quite common among different segments of the city's workforce. So, um, at one point I said um, there was no, uh, not only segregation, and now I say there was segregation, so we have to discuss about this relation and also the chrono chronological factor, the change in this segregation and the trends uh, uh, later, and we have to uh, look at the um, examples to do this. Just briefly about the modernization effort as a joint operation between imperial state or um, the center and the local elites in the cities. What Mark Mezawa writes about the reorganization of space in late Ottoman Salonika is quite applicable for other cities. Quotation marks. The urban map was being redrawn in the interests of regularity, accessibility and predictability, while the centers of governmental power, the governor's new Konak, the, the barracks, the, the Konak is an um, administration building in the Ottoman uh, context. The governor's new Konak, the barracks, the municipal, municipal hostel, hospital and the vast customs house were connected by new or enlarged roads. They and the best the bastions of commercial success, from Alatini's giant floor mills in the east to Saya's textile factory on the front and the railway station in the west, now defined the city and pointed to the new coalition of forces, the autocratic central Armenian state and the wealthy local capitalist class, which ran its affairs. End of quotation. So, the economic function of Imperial Riga Salonika, Trieste and Odessa depended on in-migration. Even, even if the respective imperial administrators tried to regulate the migration streams, the demography of the four cities followed the path of other global port cities. It was in line with traditional imperial policy that different groups of immigrants fulfilled different functions, or different population groups fulfilled different functions in the economy of the cities. So, transnational and mobile diaspora group merchants of Armenian or Greek or Jewish origin followed different, but nonetheless parallel um, ways of immigration, of migration and social ascent. On the other hand, unskilled or seasonal labor migrants who usually spoke other languages and were culturally different from the merchants, ship owners and financiers followed other patterns of immigration. The social and cultural gap between the two groups reduplicated itself in residential patterns, as I said before. Um, however, one has to differentiate in this respect between more traditional and organic patterns like in Salonika and Riga and more modern grid iron layout like in Trieste and Odessa. And the city maps provide ample illustration of this point. Uh, so, there is a close relation between different types of immigration and the separation in uh, the city space, in the, in the cityscape. And re related to that is secondly the understanding of the different function and meaning of central parts of these cities with their public and private buildings around squares and avenues in contrast to the city's margins and the districts more remote from the center. It follows then from the foregoing that spatial differences or different practices in the use of public space represented social and cultural differences between different groups of inhabitants of the imperial cities at the end of the 19th century. And one uh, thesis about the change of, of that or the historical development of that is that initially the social difference between the different groups of inhabitants of the cities was stronger than any other feeling of belonging, be it ethnically or culturally based. 
But in the last decade of the 19th century, it was already felt that this would change. The growing social unrest after 1900 and in its consequence, in the long run consequence, the nationalization of the four cities accelerated a considerable change of the cityscapes and residential patterns in the 20th, 20th century. And let me just um, come back to um, how the public uh, space of the city was um, structured and uh, come back to the architecture. I just skip um, to... I come back to Odessa, I promise. I just want to show you some um, examples of um, Urba housing. This is also in Odessa. Ah, it's not. Uh, just, uh, um, should be just. Uh, okay. Then let's do it this way. The dominant paradigm of urban representation, which made itself felt in the appearance of newly erected buildings in the center of Samika, Riga, Trieste, and Odessa in the second half of the 19th century, was distinctively bourgeois. And it was usually an imported one. It was brought to the cities by architects who had already projected buildings in other imperial centers. Like in the case of the Odessa Opera House, you may know, designed by the famous Austrian architecture studio Fellner and Helmer. Or to give you another example, Vitaliano Boselli, the favorite architect of the Ottoman elite in Salonika, uh, designed, amongst other buildings, the residence of the governor, the already mentioned Konak. In 1892, it was um, built and the countryside residence of the important Sephardic uh, family Alatini, the, old, the Alatini floor mills in, Odessa, uh, in Salonika were already mentioned. Boselli, the architect, as well built the so-called new mosque of the Dönme, the Jews who had converted to Islam following their mystic leader and self-proclaimed Messiah, Shabtai Tzvi, in Salonika. I will only mention here the Art Nouveau architect and civil engineer Mikhail uh, Eisenstein, uh, the father of the more famous Soviet director Sergei, who is admired for his Jugendstil or Art Nouveau buildings in Riga. The general impression from the redrawing of the city maps of Riga and Salonika, and to a lesser extent also the ones of Trieste and Odessa in the second half of the 19th century was a striving towards more regular regularity, the betterment of the hygienic uh, conditions, as well as the modernization of infrastructure. Um, well, but at the same time, at the end of the um, 19th century, the liberalism of the old city elites was confronted with new ideologies of national and social liberation, which originated in the not-so-noble quarters, or um, not at the core of the city. After a period of rapid and relentless growth of these cities and the accumulation of wealth in the hand of a very small group, the imperial city seemed no longer able to fulfill the promise of a prosperous future for its hard laboring inhabitants, uh, let alone progress for the heavy land. I interpre interpret the crisis in the decade after 1900 with turmoil and rioting in the streets of Riga, Odessa, Salonika, rather as a symptom of than as, a, as the cause for instability and growing social conflict. The split between the more universalist and the more particularistic ideologies ran through the mobile diaspora groups um, too. Nowadays, they are so easily associated with the cosmopolitan element in the imperial port cities. Greek and Jewish city dwellers of Odessa and Salonika, to give an example, in terms of social prestige and residence pattern, were fractured groups indeed. While the affluent cultivated a bourgeois, bourgeois life living style and conversed with each other in French, in the Salonikan case, also in Odessa and Trieste, 
or in Russian in Odessa or in German in Riga, the middle and lower classes no longer continued on the path of linguistic and cultural um, acculturation and integration. Latvians in Riga and Slovenes in Trieste were ready to learn from their masters and it may be seen as a sign of social and economic success that they were able to organize a significant ethnic sector of their own. The building of the House of the Riga Latvian Society in 1869 and the erection of the Narodny Dom or Casa Nazionale or Casa del Popolo, the Trieste National Hall in Trieste in 1907 are uh, examples or are case in point. Okay, um, I just come to um, Odessa. Um, um, in the case of Odessa, the paradigm of the port city of commerce is obvious. Lacking a serious industrial sector, the economy of the city depended almost exclusively of the commerce of the port that, that, the, that the port generated. Besides being a migration hub, Odessa's small industry was concerned with food processing, the production of farm machinery and even very late aircraft construction. The city as one of Russia's largest metropolises was a center of cultural and intellectual exchange. One of the leading liberal, liberal newspapers of the empire, the Odessa News, were edited here. A Jew from Odessa was most likely born outside the borders of the city and its surroundings. Uh, usually he came from a small place somewhere to the north, for, for instance in Volinia, uh, Volinia, and was under 18 years old uh, at the time of his immigration. If he had more than a seasonal job, he probably was a commercial clerk. That was a vocational paradigm shared by most of the inhabitants, non-Jewish inhabitants of Odessa. Um, Jewish um, traditional life was not absent in the godless, in the so-called godless city of the stock exchange and fast money, but the heterogeneity of the Jewish population in terms of cultural choice was much greater in Odessa, of course, than in the small places of origin of these new migrants. Even if Odessa's growth rates at the beginning of the 20th century resembled that of Chicago, let's say, the city was part and parcel of the Russian political and social fabric. Odessa, already in the first half of the 19th century, was known for inter-ethnic street fights, sometimes between Jews and non-Jews, particularly Greeks. The outdated model of communal administration and a lacking civic participation was not overcome until the end of the empire. To the contrary, even the few affluent Jews who were proud to sit in the city council and manage the affairs of the city were excluded from the communal self-administration uh, from the beginning of the 1890s. However, the city was not split into Jewish and non-Jewish quarters, even if a high percentage of Jewish immigrants chose to live in the famous industrial backyard district of Moldavanka. This choice was probably due to the comparably lower rents. Moldavanka contributed much to the image of Odessa as a city of thieves, yet it was also the place where the, part, where the greatest part of the Jewish population lived who most ardently adhered to the traditional ways of religious life. The Moldavanka as the archetypical Jewish quarter in Odessa has been depicted by Isaac Badel, as you know, and um, um, sorry, the Moldavanka, yeah, as it has been depicted by Isaac Badel, was home to another social and uh, migratory group than the central streets of Odessa in the city center where some of the better situated Jews uh, live. And we can easily uh, grasp uh, an idea of, of this if we have a look at the quite considerable member lists of the different Jewish societies uh, in Odessa. And if we establish a connection between the prestige of an individual and his or her place of living, given um, that uh, these member lists uh, also include addresses, and we can easily uh, see um, um, how one individual fits into this pattern and fits into this spatial model. I wanted to show you a uh, kind of interactive city map 
of Odessa, which is provided by the um, Yibo Encyclopedia um, of Jews in Eastern Europe. Unfortunately, um, we were not able to um, start the uh, respective uh, software program, but anyway, I, I uh, may uh, show it um, later to you. And what you find is, um, I come back to the city map, what you find is that uh, they have uh, in the uh, they have inserted on the map uh, places of synagogues, places of um, uh, societies um, of uh, the Jewish population, and even individual living places of uh, important members of Jewish or lesser community. And so you can get a picture of uh, which social standing a particular person uh, was. Um, the milieu of the pity merchants, as well as the public intellectuals, from which the particular group later become well known under the name of the Sages of Odessa, lived um, close to, but not at the very center of the city. Uh, here we just see a picture of um, four men playing cards, which was um, a popular habit in uh, the uh, clubs uh, and societies in Odessa, uh, but this is the English club, a very exclusive club, and this was, it was not, um, not a Jewish club, but I just show it to you as an example for the um, sociability, sociability in Odessa, and here we have a picture of um, uh, the uh, leading uh, individuals, uh, leading members of the so-called Odessa uh, committee, and in memorial literature, uh, they were um, called the sages uh, of Odessa, Hachmei uh, Odessa. And uh, um, I can come back later to this picture and can, you, can give you the names of these um, individuals. Among them, uh, uh, Moses like uh, Lilian Bloom and um, Achata Arn and Chayda Van Bialik. Um, I think Simon Dukov is uh, uh, um, not uh, depicted in this picture, but what I was going to say is if you just look at the living, uh, at the residential patterns of, of individuals and of groups from uh, particular societies, you get an idea of um, what social segment of the population, in, the, in, that case of, in that case of the Jewish population, they represent. Um, these um, groups, and particularly the uh, uh, on this photograph, uh, the, the, the group, uh, they used to gather in their own modest apartments or especially for summer retreat at the former German colony of Lustorf, Lustorf uh, outside Odessa, uh, at the seashore. And um, we can clearly see that the existing ethnic and social borders in Odessa's urban space were provided with meaning by Jewish intellectual figures like uh, Simon Dubnov, Achata uh, Arm, and um, Menel Mörfers Forum, or Sholem Janke Tabanovich, or um, Leon Pinsker. Um, the architecture of the main synagogues, um, on one hand, and the many small and sometimes Hasidic prayer houses in Odessa on the other side, are another point in case. The built environment, that is, the architecture of sacred places like these, should be analyzed as an expression of Jewish self identification. If we look, for instance, at the architecture of the synagogue, called Rodi um, Synagogue, I just have to find it. We might look for possible signs of an identification with an universalist, universalist understanding of culture, which promoted a certain blindness concerning ethnic groups. We might also look for other contradictory signs, which suggest an identification with a particular ethnic or particular religious group. In the case of Jewish, Greek, or Armenian entrepreneurs, a cosmopolitan outlook was one of their outstanding traits. This was perceived as a negative attribute by middle class and workers influenced by the emerging nationalist and social democratic movements, Jewish and non-Jewish alike. Um, if we think of Odessa as a place where ethnic and social spaces coexisted, uh, which framed different conflicts, then we can look at these examples. We can, exam we can look at examples of um, uh, sociability, because that is a kind of public space which is 
created by these societies. We can look of we can look at buildings like uh, these, uh, like the uh, synagogue, which, because it's also part of the build of the cityscape. Um, and it's, it relates to other buildings, um, and it, 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 it also a message. Uh, just uh, if you want to have a look to the interior of that uh, body synagogue. Uh, um, but uh, what we didn't speak about were the violent clashes on the streets of Odessa during uh, regular uh, the, um, um, uh, during pogroms, which which came um, regularly uh, um, to Odessa cityscape, uh, because uh, this is also these pogroms in, in that perspective can also be understood as an expression of a conflict over common public space. Jews by the pogromchiki were often seen as persons who do not belong to the city or simply had not the same social and political rights. Um, Since I'm uh, unfortunately running out of time, I will just um, give you some um, short impression of the multi-ethnic landscape of the other three cities and the uh, respective um, um, public um, conflicts and um, the uh, change of the cityscape. I just uh, brought you this um, page from a calendar from a, uh, from a Saloniki because it shows the uh, um, I think seven languages which are used and five um, <coughs> systems of counting um, the um, the time and uh, the five uh, yeah systems of um, calendar. Um, I will not uh, read it to you um, because I think. It, in a way, it speaks for itself as, as a, in a metaphor, metaphorical way. Um, I will skip the demographic data, which I have also collected for the other cities. Um, we can come back to that data in the discussion. And this photo, you can see that Saranika had a city wall, which was, la which was laid down. Um, uh, and with the demolition of its city walls and the works carried out to modernize different parts and buildings of the city in the last decades of the 19th century, some of the monuments from ancient times were rediscovered. Um, but after a fire in 1890, more central street, streets were widened and strengthened again. And you have all probably known, uh, you have probably heard of the uh, big Saloniki fire of 1917, which destroyed it great part of the Jewish uh, living uh, and residential area in Saloniki. And these fires were uh, um, common in Saloniki because a uh, great part of the um, city buildings were built from wood. Um, I just, yeah, one of these uh, ancient monuments which uh, came out during this modernization of the streets uh, is depicted here. And uh, I show you a kind of aerial uh, view, um, which was printed uh, in uh, Mezawa's, um, in the first edition of Mezawa's book. And you can see uh, the port and the uh, railway station on, on this side of the picture. And, and this is just, um, yeah, this um, the. Um, greater part of the city, still surrounded by walls, which later, as I said, were laid down. And you see this um, last, uh, last uh, tower um, still standing today and uh, serving as a symbol of Ottoman times in Salonika. <coughs> um, from, yeah, it, this uh, city map of Sonica was drawn in the, um, if I'm not mistaken, after 1890, and you can uh, see that this um, regular patterns of spaces are, uh, is already um, dominant. You have the streetcar, as we have seen it in Odessa, um, and we have uh, that part of the city in black which was destroyed by the 
uh, great uh, fire. Similar to Riga, the city space of Trieste, the principal port city of the Habsburg monarchy, in terms of political aspirations, was contested between rival ethnic groups, as I said before, the Slovenes in Trieste, uh, who were mostly immigrants from the closer vicinity and from uh, also some from more distant areas, had to come to terms with the hegemony of the old elites of the city, who, for their part, preferred Italian as a language of culture and public communication. The resulting cultural conflict could easily be compared with the respective controversy in Riga. For both groups, Latvians and Slovenes, the big city was important was an important destination for labor migration, and for both groups it fulfilled functions of a national capital to be. In the uh, Slovene case, Trieste, I think, uh, at some point had more Slovenian inhabitants than um, Indiana. Um, maybe it does not seem logical to you to include Riga in this uh, comparison of uh, four cities. Um, because the city had a much uh, longer uh, history, uh, going back to the Middle Ages, and um, instead of uh, modern uh, newly built houses, uh, as in the case of Odessa uh, and the other cities, the silhouette of Riga was shaped by the dominant church bell towers built from red brick stones typically applied around the Baltic Sea. The central district, with its churches and monuments, Riga Cathedral, Churches of St. James and St. Peter, Riga Castle is a testimony to the golden past of the city which benefited from the trade network of the Hansa, which was an important transshipment point, in, in which it was an important, uh, important transshipment point. Um, but what justifies the inclusion of Riga as an imperial city in a comparative treatment uh, is that the port of Riga had become one of the most important Russian ports since it was connected to Russia's granary, the southern black soil area of Ukraine. The population of Riga between 1850 and 1900 increased tenfold. This economic and demographic growth was represented in the change of the appearance of the city, whose walls, as in Thalonica, um, were laid down and a garden-like structure around the medieval center instead was laid out. Um, well, just a word to the uh, multi-ethnic um, structure of inhabitants. Um, communities like Latvians, Russians and Jews from the Pale of Settlement lived often together in ethnic enclaves in several suburbs of Riga, Moscow suburbs, St. Petersburg suburb and Utah suburb. Um, and that was noted in the old Russian census of 1897. The houses were often built from wooden structures and industrial enterprises were situated nearby. As it has been written in a study on multinational or multi-ethnic Riga, even if a visitor of the Riga city center might have imagined itself to be in a truly and historically German city, it was just a minute's walk away that you could immerse in a Jewish shtetl shop in a Latvian village store or could listen to the latest neighborhood gossip in pure Russia. If in the 1860s the residential place of an inhabitant was in most cases a clear indication of his or her social prestige as well as of the re respective ethnic backgrounds and affiliation, the connection between class and ethnic belonging was loosened because of the social mobility of Latvians and Jews. And uh, at the dawn of the empire before 1914, social segregation trumped still ethnic segregation as a residential type of Riga. Just coming to uh, a kind of conclusion and um, the formulation of questions. Um, I would propose that there were two types of paradigms of ethnic affiliation and ethnic conflicts in the four cities, only briefly introduced here. Um, the Trieste, the Liga paradigm and the Odessa Salonica paradigm. In the first case, two ethnic groups, Albertes and Liga, two ethnic groups claim the city and its space. Uh, both of them, no, uh, one of them with the argument of the past glory and the other one with the argument of the bright, of the bright future. So Germans and Latvians and Liga and Slovenes 
and Italians in Trieste. Slovenes and Latvians are the marginalized groups, which are mostly in migrants and live in separate residential areas, apart from the city center. In the other case of Odessa and Salonika, the hinterland of the city, the surroundings, is not the home to the biggest ethnic group of immigrants. Even if in the case of Odessa, many Jews and Ukrainians came from places to the north of Odessa to the city, they did not claim Odessa as their national capital uh, for them. Rather, they were influenced by the idea of Odessa as a Russian imperial city. Odessa, as John Clear um, uh, has observed, uh, was um, the uh, opposite of a Städter, it was a non Städter. The influence of a kind of imperial ideology in places as Odessa and Salonika is much greater than in Trieste and Riga. The representatives of the dominant ethnic group in the respective empires are not ethnic or religious majorities. Turks or Muslims in Salonika are not a majority, and Russians are not a minority, uh, not a majority in, in Odessa. But they dominate uh, the respective city cultures or the respective cultures of uh, public cultures. Um, what then can one take from all this uh, for Jewish history? Um, the two respective paradigms, Trieste, Riga, Odessa, Salonika as I think, are also mirrored in the Jewish cases. More or less bourgeois acculturation in Trieste and Riga, Italian and German language as languages of social mobility and um, an expression of culturedness. On one hand, and on the other, uh, imperial acculturation uh, together with a strong social and national liberation movement, Zionists and social democrats as examples for it, um, in the case of the Jewish populations in Odessa and Salonika. So, as well as, uh, in, as, well as in Odessa, as well as in Salonika, you had um, uh, Jewish labor uh, movements and you had um, Zionist um, uh, self-organization of, of the Jewish um, public. Um, so, um, I ask your pardon for leaving it at that time is more than run out and I hope that we can come to some uh, problems and uh, questions of this model and of this reflection in the discussion and um, until then I just um, say thank you for your um, kind um, 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 listening to, to my to my words and hope that we um, uh, can come to a um, better understanding of that um, um, interesting as I as I'm still convinced very interesting <laughs> material. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Professor, for this uh, very interesting lecture. Now we have uh, more than half an hour for question and discussions and. Uh, uh, I uh, can ask first question and then uh, pass uh, to the uh, other audience. Uh, so it's like um, first question that came in mind is uh, violence in these cities uh, because you are speaking uh, about uh, some uh, mechanism, some uh, logic of a common coexisting of different groups, but. If I'm not mistaken, in all of the cities, right, in, during the first, uh, uh, even in the end of the 19th century, but uh, also in the early 20th century, uh, there are some accidents or even phenomena of anti Jewish violence and other first types of violence in different groups. And uh, in terms of this uh, comparison, do you see uh, any uh, connection between the city structure, this kind of similar modernization process, and uh, interacting violence in the cities? Or we still should understand this, uh, this violence more in the context of the historical regions or countries in which uh, this violence appeared? Um, thank you very much. I haven't made it. Um, explicit. Um, I think that, um, and, and uh, I have not talked about 
violence, uh, even uh, if I mentioned it in the case of Odessa, I just skipped it uh, over it because uh, I think um, this, some of the basic uh, facts um, are well known. Um, that pogrom pattern in the Russian Empire was an urban one, um, is um, on one hand obvious, and on the other hand leads to the question why and um, what does it so, so, so what, where is the connection to the city structure? And I've not made it explicit, but the idea was to say, or my argument was, that uh, as long as the model of imperial integration uh, uh, exists, it cannot longer fulfill social integration in the city. Uh, or, or let's just talk in other terms. Odessa can no longer fulfill the promise of social uh, mobility, and this is true for uh, Jews and non-Jews alike. Uh, in, uh, might be on a on, on a on a scale, and um, I understand in this perspective. I understand uh, um, the um, escalation of violence in uh, the, pro the problems in Odessa as um, um, coming from this conflict between city center, liberal uh, elite, uh, mostly um, with transnational uh, cosmopolitan uh, worldview and outlook, and, and the um, periphery uh, of um, when, when um, of course, it's it's a symbolic conflict and it's a social conflict, and it's not always that the symbolic conflict is only representing social difference, which would be a very, in my view, simplistic uh, um, explanation. But what I'm um, going to say is that, um, for from the perspective of the of the uh, margins of these cities, there was no common city. I mean, there was no. Um, 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 there's this German word, <laughs> Appellationsinstanz, and, and um, there was no um, understanding of um, um, a common um, moral um, code. I mean, at least in this. Um, um, tempor temporal, um, chaotic uh, situation of, of this uh, street violence. And um, the only um, pattern of argumentation I found in these sources about the problems in Odessa is that, that uh, um, anti Jewish uh, um, uh, violence is. Um, um, is an expression of the idea that um, the, the Tsar and the Tsar's uh, symbols were, um, were um, violated by, 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 Jewish, by, by Jewish revolutionaries slash Jews. And, uh, and there's, no, there's no argument um, um, connected to the city as, as an idea or as a common, common, common space. Um, but I would say that the social conflict still um, is is very um, um, <clears throat> I would say that this, the social um, <coughs> conflict between um, persons from from the same uh, from the same living quarter is. Um, Kind has a kind uh, of. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm mean just liking the words. <laughs> um, I think it's it's a different conflict between two individuals uh, living at the margin of the city. Let's say one Greek, one Jewish, and there is a conflict uh, when at the Jewish uh, um, uh, Purim uh, is the is the is the Greek uh, Easter. Um, and you have just conflicts over um, public space uh, in the sense of uh, is it now um, a happy, uh, a very happy space, or is it, is it, is it uh, a, a good Friday? Is it, it's a very um, uh, sad space. But uh, what I was thinking about was the conflict between 
the margins and the center of the city, and uh, that uh, there was this, um, um, yeah. And, and this conflict was was uh, just reformulated uh, sometimes in uh, terms of social protest and sometimes in terms of national liberation. And what happens in the 20th century that I think that this structure collapses and the city center in a way is cleansed from all these liberal elites and then just uh, another idea of city is established as a national center for somebody. Uh, uh, yeah, well, that, that would be the Trieste-Riga model, but the other model I have to think about. Uh, thank you for your lecture. I think that it's very difficult to compare this uh, four city space in one topic in your research. And my question is, uh, maybe pragmatic, <laughs> what's the methodological approaches of your research? And the second uh, one is, you mentioned about uh, uh, Moldavanka. It's a, uh, it's a um, small region in uh, Abese, if I correctly understand. Yes. It was a prestigious or non prestigious places in Odessa in your period, and what is the situation of Moldavanka today? I think it's not prestigious region in Odessa. Thank you. Um, and why? I don't know if it's. No, it's it's just too. Um, um, you can't you can't uh, see it uh, here. Um, um, maybe it's, do we have another one. No. Ah, maybe this is better. Do we find Modavanka? No, it's too. Uh, it's it's on the left of, uh, side. Yeah, we have said it's it's uh, too <laughs> but, um, yeah, but Anyway. Uh, Maybe there's is this German one that no, can we make it bigger? Well, um, what, what, I, what I'm going to say is you, you see this um, rectangular pattern of streets in the center, mm -hmm. and you see um, a kind of area, um, yeah, di different different areas um, uh, around, and you see the port area, um, um, and you see an industrial area um, to, the, to the north. Well, maybe maybe when we look at the other map. No, it was... Well, it's now, now it's... <laughs> so, you, you see, this is the port, yes. and um, I think the Peresip area, the uh, industrial area is to the north of the port, yes. and you see, but I'm not sure if Moda Banka is, uh, is this area. Well, anyway, um, um, you first, yeah. Um, you, you asked. You asked if I understood it correct about my methodological approach, and the second was the discussion uh, Modavaka. Um, Modavaka today. Um, I mean, I lived there, uh, so um, uh, I can't um, answer this question. But in, in this, in this, uh, in this model of the uh, time around 1900, I presented. I would say uh, it's clearly not uh, the um, um, core of, of, of the city, and it's also um, only partly in, in a kind of um, enlarged area. It, 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 it was a living region for uh, persons who couldn't afford uh, to live in multi uh, or in, in three story uh, wood, uh, stone houses. It was um, a much more um, cheap, uh, much more cheap buildings, and these um, um, inhabitants of Odessa uh, living in Modavanka came from, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, um, there were there were there were there were immigrants who came from uh, regions, uh, um, as I mentioned before, to the north, and uh, um, not all of them were Jewish, and not all of them were. Um, um, living uh, uh, 
pi pious Jewish life is uh, fulfilling of all the requirements of religion. But the what I said is that percentage of, of uh, uh, traditional living Jews in Moravanka was higher than in other um, um, uh, places, which is an indication for their uh, lower social social status, I would argue, uh, or uh, which is an indication of their places of origin. Uh, if they come from little shtetls, they just um, some of them continue their way of living in Moravanka. And later, Moravanka became, in a way, Mythologized uh, partly by um, 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 by, by Isaac Babel uh, in his uh, in his um, depiction of Odessa, uh, but uh, part of it was already done in imperial times in the pages of the newspapers in Odessa. Um, sometimes as a kind of um, sometimes. Stories about criminals were used uh, to gain more readership, uh, as in now, our times. So, so these stories um, just speak of Madawanka as a place of uh, uh, criminality, but also as a place where um, yeah, there, there's some there is something in this criminality. It's, it's, um, it's just more than it's, it's sex and crime, yeah, basically. Um, so, um, and in Soviet times, also the stereotypes of um, Odessa is uh, of, of late imperial Odessa. Uh, they also played with that um, idea that in Odessa uh, um, people lived who were always funny and made, uh, uh, made jokes about everything, which was a kind of saying um, that this was a Jewish uh, population there. And if you if you don't want to mention that uh, any Jews lived in Odessa, you say that um, um, they were very clever and very uh, funny, and then. Um, Nowadays, I think it's between uh, thorough historicization of, of that history and of the, that quarter. They, they came out, um, I think, now it's already um, some years ago, it, it came out a very um, nicely illustrated book with um, pictures from historical modern Anka, um, based on the archival materials in the Oblastai Archiv. Um, uh, I think, yeah. Uh, and. Um, uh, but this is this is um, just the beginning because uh, a lot of uh, the um, research on Moravanka is kind of um, um, re-presenting uh, older materials without um, um, asking, um, yeah, about these stereotypes of um, pity. Uh, uh, gangsters and Jews, uh, trad traditional Jews and uh, Ukrainians and Russians from, from the countryside living together in this uh, kind of shtetl inside the, the, the big city. And one thing is important that uh, Modavanka was not, at, as the city center was, was not um, included in, I mean, was not, uh, the living conditions were very bad, just, just in terms of uh, infrastructure and of uh, uh, hygienic uh, conditions. Uh, and so, so um, um, I think, I, I, I don't know if it's today, um, so we have to ask if somebody from Odessa is here. <laughs> and methodological approach, I have mentioned that um, I don't want to be um, uh, just, um, I, I, I don't want to apply Marxist uh, stereotypes to four cities, that, that's not my idea, I just want to make an, a suggestion that um, we uh, should understand these cities um, much more in terms of um, different social uh, spaces and also different cultural spaces um, and their change and conflict than as just simply um, multi-ethnic um, paradise. Um, this is just a reaction to some kind of um, public um, uh, presentation of, of uh, images of these cities and also part of the memory literature which came out of course um, after um, the, the Holocaust uh, but also after uh, 1989 and uh, until today um, uh, is a mood of writing or thinking about these cities in which um, we have clearly good times and bad times. And I just argue that we should uh, much more, we, we really should uh, 
and look to the housing blocks and look uh, how they live together and how, yeah. Um, um, so it's not really a methodolo methodological program, <laughs> but just a critical um, um, question. Um. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you so much. Very interesting, and it's very close to what I tend to do in, in my research. I also very interested in cityscape and how you, you can see these ethnic divisions and separations inside cityscape. And the idea is Galicia, not the Russian Empire. And I have a question. So we have this uh, center and uh, rich elites, Jewish or Greek or, or whatever, uh, who are moving towards the center and they build new housing and like very luxury building and they try to eliminate all the all the mentions that they are Jewish. They don't put the Magen mm -hmm. on it. How how these buildings are perceived in the public image? How do people still call them like Jewish house? Because they in but from my experience in Galicia the all these houses they have uh, they are called by names of the owners or by uh, like Gartenberg House, Segal House, by, by Jew, name of Jewish owners or name of somebody else, and how they are perceived in, in, in public image. Can you, can, you, can you see it from the sources? Um, thank you for that interesting um, question. Um, as, um, what I understand um, is that um, the um, appearance and the um, architecture of, um, of uh, bourgeois uh, houses or <coughs> in, that, in that case of a, of a um, sacred uh, um, space or uh, a building functioning uh, as, uh, as a sacred space um, uh, I think that um, you can you don't have to hide your Jewishness if you transform this Jewishness into uh, much more um, a, a much more um, adoptable um, form, uh, or in other words, um, I think um, if we look to uh, house, like, if we look to buildings like a synagogue, uh, at first glance, it doesn't make sense to ask. How this building can hide its Jewishness? Because uh, um, what is the synagogue about? The synagogue is built for, built for Jews, and even if you might not agree about what is Jew, Judaism or what, what, what is what is a Jew or which um, which what you have to uh, which things you have to practice or not, but, but, but the, the, the idea of this building is to build um, a space for Jews. Um, and uh, so, uh, what what I was going to say, or, or my argument is that if you build this building in um, forms. Um, of other, um, let's say, um, churches or, or if you build a mosque in this, in, in, in this space, you already adapt to a common and by that more universal pattern um, as if you would preserve uh, the, let's say, um, wooden um, technique of building um, uh, synagogues in, 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 in um, Galicia. And the small shtetl prayer houses and Hasidic uh, stiebel in, in, in Odessa, which still, uh, which uh, uh, are already uh, also existing in much more, uh, in much bigger numbers, are just eliminated in research. And research is always looking for this um, cosmopolitan Jewish bourgeois outlook. But uh, if we take this example, obviously, uh, it's not, um, uh, it's not. Uh, no wonder, uh, and I also did not find photos of of Hasidic uh, prayer houses in Odessa. Maybe because these photos uh, are not existing. Maybe because nobody did photos of it. Because making a photo of it is, is already uh, a step in the process of uh, presenting something or representing something to somebody. And this building, to uh, cityscape, and to uh, other people, other other individuals from this city, non-Jews, uh, speaks um, just by its forms. It's just saying that, um, yeah, uh, well, um, uh, besides I'm being, being a synagogue, or besides uh, I am being a Jewish house, I'm just part of this built um, landscape of the city. And I mean, obviously, I mean, I'm not an um, art historian or uh, 
expert of architecture, but if you just look at these uh, small um, uh, cool, um, towers, uh, these four uh, towers, you might have the impression that this is a, uh, might be from the Russian or Orthodox uh, uh, church. So of course this uh, does not answer your, your question, but if we just look at a much more um, representative uh, house, I mean, I'm not sure if this is uh, um, was projected or owned or, uh, by Jews or if, if Jews lived there, but uh, if we have other examples, I mean, you might have um, in mind some very uh, affluent Jewish um, families, more less than Watsky family or uh, others. Of course, they, they built houses in this way, and there was no Magen David. And uh, I mean, I'm not sure about I'm not sure about the uh, the Mezuzoto, but I don't think that they that they had. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, that, that one has to check in, in every uh, in every case. Um, um, and uh, at the end of this period, period, to me, it seems as if some of these so liberal and so cosmopolitan elite understood that this is not. Uh, I mean, that they cannot just be ethnically uh, neutral. And some of them, um, I think, you know about uh, the Vysotsky uh, family, which funded uh, the um, journal in which Achata uh, Arm and uh, Klausner and others published. And I'm just taking um, uh, uh, no, it was not Hamaki. It was. Um, I just had to look up the name, which came out in Odessa for a short time, in Warsaw, and later it was transferred to Palestine. Uh, and, and this was, as far as I know, it was financed by, by Wysotsky, uh, who also transferred to Israel. Uh, I mean, uh, Wysotsky, you can uh, just find it in Israel nowadays. So, what I'm going to say is, some of them substituted this seemingly neutral or Adoptable Jewishness, um, or not such a Jewish, but but just just um, gave it another um, uh, note. I mean, some of them financed the Jewish hospital in Odessa, which was a hospital for all uh, people coming, but it was built by uh, Jewish funds, and it uh, of course had uh, uh, Jewish doctors, uh, and uh, yeah, and so so it, um, and also. I think the, the solution is not either or, but some of these very affluent and rich persons of Odessa, they were head of and honorary members of several Odessa societies. Among them Jewish societies, among them non-Jewish societies. So they they just um, spread their uh, um, funds and their and their personal dedication to to both parts. So you could call this being ethnically neutral or blind, but you also, I mean, it depends. You also could, could say that there is maybe uh, a trend towards being, uh, yeah, being more um, engaged in Jewish uh, issues than in, let's say, Greek or other issues. Um, uh, yeah. Professor, uh, thank you for much, and uh, I'd like to ask you maybe as I continue on this question, uh, but uh, I ask in Russian if you don't mind. Вы много говорили о социальных процессах и экономических, в том числе о влиянии иммигрантов, о управлении иммигрантов. И для меня есть момент, ну и вы говорили о превращении и этих портовых городов, да, такие мегаполисы во второй половине 19 века. И, э, в принципе, большинство населения да, этих городов — это мигранты. Uh -huh. И это речь не только о евреях. Да? Yeah. Но при этом э, для меня всегда проблема остается вписать э, в эту картину какие-то политические моменты объяснения. Mm -hmm. да? И, э, то есть, э, для меня, с одной стороны, столкновение, вот эти социальные конфликты, в том числе антиевейское насилие, да, которое появляется ближе к концу 19 века, это моменты вот такие социальных конфликтов в разных групп населения, которые только пребывают в это пространство. Не всегда могут учиться в силу разных причин. 
Но с другой стороны, есть тот же дискурс, который использовался определенными политическими силами, о том, что ну, где евреи представлялись как переселенцы, чужаки, которые пришли вот туда, где уже жило не еврейское насилие. Mm -hmm. вот, один из политических моментов. Да? То есть социально-экономические моменты вы объясняете, но как вы используете, как вы вписываете политические моменты в эти процессы, которые могли приводить к напряжению и к открытому России. It's um it's um thank you thank you very much um for that um uh question. Um as I said before maybe uh that, that's a problem of that um of that um theoretical approach or non uh, it, it's maybe a lack of methodology 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 um but um political um discourse To me, uh, I mean, it, it was um, much more interesting to me to uh, read what uh, different individuals from these cities uh, thought of this conflict than to um, follow what you are asking for, as I understand it, that you are asking for the political discourse in the non-Jewish um, public space about Jews as intruders and 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 um, and um, migrants. Um, I mean, in the case of Odessa, um, it's obvious that that they did not migrate. A uh, Jews did, if they migrated to Odessa, they did not migrate to a place where um, others lived. So because because, because it was uh, in a way it was a new city and it was a new space, and, and uh, so I would rather say that. Even at that time, it was obvious that Jews and non-Jews alike uh, migrated to the city. Uh, it was even at this very early point, early point of imperial courtesy towards Jews, uh, <coughs> encouraged that Jews um, left this um, old um, um, place all the places of their living, uh, I'm speaking of these uh, um, uh, little shepherds, and, and so, so um, at, at a very early point of the development of Odessa, they could be, they could felt uh, uh, to be really among the, fa the, the founders of the city. I mean, the, the early years of the development of Odessa, uh, you find, you can find Jews um, very prominently in the um, also in functions of the administration of the city. Uh, um, but yeah, that, 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 that changes um, later. But what I was, I mean, that, that what you asked for is just um, gave me the association um, uh, about um, particular biographies and um, I don't know how to how to address it. Uh, I would say that um, maybe it's not um, by accident that um, um, people like Jabotinsky they um, develop a perspective, as I would argue, from 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 the margins or from I mean I mean by margins I mean also the margins of the built. Um, um, a city, but also, of course, uh, he himself was in a minority inside the public Jewish um, uh, opinion. At least, if we speak about um, these Jewish societies uh, around 1900, so he he, he could not uh, win over the majority um, of the Odessa branch of the society for the uh, uh, diffusion of of. of um, of education among Jews uh, in Russia, um, because he wanted uh, much more Hebrew. Uh, he wanted a kind of nationalization of of, uh, of education, and he was not um, able to convince uh, the majority of that of that society. And um, I I think um, um, that um, Jotinsky more clearly than others 
uh, from the center probably could see uh, that this imperial model uh, of, um, of this city is no longer just no longer working. And he also sees he, he also in this in, from this perspective he, he much clearer can can look at the Ukrainian uh, case. Uh, Ukrainian uh, I think this is not an accident that that is an individual like him who was um, yeah, another generation than the um, uh, city elite, uh, uh, Jewish members of the city elite, and uh, another, yeah, another perspective of, on, on, on the city. And a similar case you'll find in uh, Trieste, when um, some Italian Jews are, want to be so much Italian that they even, uh, that they even um, were among the few Jewish um, um, fans, or yeah, I'm liking the words, fans of of of, uh, of Mussolini. Uh, when Mussolini comes to Trieste in, in, in the twenties, or was it in, maybe it was at the end of the twenties or even the thirties, uh, uh, to to um, uh, defend his um, or to speak about this uh, racial laws he introduced in Italy against the Jews. Um, he even at that time uh, still was applauded by some 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 guest Jews, and I think it's just this perspective of of the um, marginalized um, um, group from 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 periphery of of of, of the of the uh, city of the imperial city, which in that case were uh, also uh, Jews. But it's just an idea. But, but this doesn't help you with. <laughs> With the um, introduction of political discourse in this picture, yeah, um, I'm not sure about the programs, and I have to think about it um, uh, again. And I, I only can thank you for it. Um, um, effort to to uh, bring me more to political questions. <laughs> we have other questions. Do we have time? Yeah, we still have a few minutes. Um, uh, one and two. Okay. Okay, so two, maybe let's collect these two questions and uh, after. Okay. Well, thank you for an interesting lecture and uh, to continue the question that Tom I just asked you, I want to ask you about uh, local authorities, uh, about institutions of local authorities. Uh, have you um, uh, explored uh, how the <coughs> local governance uh, made an influence on interesting relations on those cities because for it's four we're talking about four different cities uh, mm -hmm. from different political systems here yeah, they are similar because they uh, belong to different empires but the traditions of local governance were very different, for example, in the Austrian Empire and Russian Empire, the Austrian Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire gives more autonomy for uh, its cities than the Russian Empire. And from the institutional dimension, maybe, have you exported this influence on Interethnic relations and whether inclusive, more inclusive approach to uh, guiding cities, and maybe it has had a positive or not had positive uh, influence on the situation, political situation, and uh, violence, interesting violence, conflicts. So, thank you. And let's have a uh, last question. Okay, I uh, think maybe if we all do, I will be interested and I will ask in Russian if you don't mind. Я вернусь к вопросу методологии, поскольку одна вещь не дает мне покоя. Вы взяли четыре города, из них, мне кажется, Одесса немного выпадает. Почему? Потому что она находится в ряду имперских городов, основанных по инициативе Российской империи на новоцервированных землях. И, соответственно, в Одессе, вы сами говорили о том, что сюда все приходили как на новое место, новое пространство, не занятое. И не было вот того бэкграунда истории этнических взаимоотношений, этнического сосуществования, которое было в трех других городах. 
Как это влияло ну, на период, о котором вы говорите, да, вы говорили про второе основание городов, сказали, что Одесса это не касается. Мне кажется, это вот тот момент, который по методологии ну, слабо извинен. Mm -hmm. May I just um, answer your question, uh, your, uh, or try to answer your question as the first one? Um, maybe I have not made it um, clear, um, especially because um, we know that um, Odessa is an exception from, from these four. We can just think with it as an example. So that helps me to um, look at the other cities and First, of course, very simply look for differences and for similarities. So when I did this, and uh, I came with that idea that all the cities were, in a way, newly founded, as you um, um, uh, pointed uh, to, to, to that part of my talk. Um, and I think if we propose or if we suggest that there are all, in a way, uh, and in several respects, newly founded, in the 19th century, even if at uh, different times, we might, I would argue, uh, if we, 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 we might, um, um, uh, we might um, justly uh, uh, include um, uh, um, Odessa in this, uh, in this um, sample or in this comparison. I mean, you will. The question is always, which uh, are the are the similarities um, big enough, and are the uh, differences um, uh, small enough? And uh, I decided that, or I, I would argue that that um, the difference between Odessa and the other three is at least no uh, more or not, not greater than the differences, or than than yeah, difference between Odessa and other. Let's say global boxes. You can, you can just. Uh, I mean, that that uh, the end of the 19th century, uh, global cities are booming every, everywhere around the globe. So you, what would be very interesting to compare with the Asiatic port, uh, colonial port. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, but I'm not the person. Uh, I'm lacking the uh, um, linguistic uh, um, and other um, experience to, to do it. So I, my idea, you're right, indeed. I wanted, or you were right indeed, I wanted to include these empires with different institutional approaches or different institutional traditions towards uh, multi-ethnicity or multi-ethnic uh, uh, living together uh, in the cities. And maybe I did not understand 100% of the question, but to me, uh, it seems as if uh, Odessa can be can be included uh, in this uh, sample. I mean, as I said before, to, maybe it's better only to compare Odessa and Salonika. But also then you can say Salonika is very old, Odessa is very, very newly found. But the, but the population of, of at a certain point is so new that, well, but I, I take it as an, as an, um, as an uh, suggestion that probably it's easier to compare Riga and Odessa. The same political uh, mm -hmm. frame, and this, and even yeah, even, even uh, sometimes similar uh, groups of populations who migrating probably from one place. One brother is going to Odessa, one to Riga. We can just imagine if, if that is the case or not. But yeah, we can. Uh, maybe it's easier to do this. I want to be. Uh, yeah, I wanted to do more. <laughs> yeah, and coming to the institutions. Um, Thank you very much. That, that was uh, completely lacking, and I apologize for it because it's, of course, an important precondition for any comparison that you just speak about the frames. And um, I won't go into detail. I, I don't have uh, <laughs> the time now. But um, um, here again, uh, I'm just reacting to trends in historiography. And there was a trend um, when uh, the Habsburg Empire was depicted as. Um, very liberal compared to Russia. Um, and um, in the case of Trieste, we have the situation that um, at a certain point, Trieste was given the status of a Freistaat, of a, of a kind of uh, free uh, 
not, yeah, not free state, but free city, um, in the sense of that it was it, it, it was its own political um, so-called, I mean, it was not a federal country, but it was its own um, uh, country of, of the monarchy. So you all, you, not only did you had um, elections, which covered a greater part of the city population than in the case of Dessa uh, and Riga, um, but also you had elections on several um, um, for several institutional uh, uh, parliamentary chambers. So you had the representation of the city in itself as in the city council, and you had elections to the uh, um, deputies of the city in the uh, Reichsrat, in the imperial uh, council in uh, in, in, in the Vienna. Um, but, but, but interestingly, and this is only possible if you do the comparison, and not if you just compare Riga and Lessa, interestingly, even if you had not only an uh, earlier um, democratic uh, and um, more encompassing um, system of elections, and then after, in, 1907, in 1907 uh, it was the uh, right to elect was given to all the population, even, um, still, you have this old Italian elites who are, don't ask me how they do it, <laughs> um, but, 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 but uh, until 1907 they can just mostly uh, unchallenge, they can hold their grip on the political uh, um, uh, power in the city. Uh, of course, they have to be careful not to um, come into conflict with Vienna, uh, and sometimes they are more uh, successful in this, and sometimes are not. But uh, but what? Uh, but the economic power of the city and, and the political power for for a long period in the nineteenth century is in one point in, in, in a small group of hands. So you could you you could even go and say this is a kind of oligarchic model, even if they use democratic. Uh, um, Methods to to uh, to uh, found it, but but what happens then? In 1907, then uh, the uh, workers and, and and also the Slovenes in, in the city, which as a rule were much more uh, um, at the social margins, become become the right to to vote. And now social democracy uh, gains a um, great uh, share of the votes to the city council, but also to the uh, votes um, um, for the for the uh, imperial council. And, and um, so the Italians have to think about new uh, alliances and have to uh, think about how to fight. And, and one can even argue that fascism in that Italian shape uh, or the particular Triestine tradition of fascism uh, has its origin there because only if you exclude the Slovenes from, 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 the, from the political process or from the electorate you can, you can uh, ensure that Trieste is preserving its Italianità, its, its Itali Italianness. So, and, 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 and this is very interesting because um, um, as I said before this Italianness is so obvious I don't know how uh, to describe it with other words, but it's so strong that it's even attracting, as I said before, um, Jews, Germans, and other uh, uh, groups which are not that dominant as <coughs> Italians and Slovenes in the city. And so it's uh, really a decision that you are for this side of this side. And the social democracy, to give it uh, the, the truth, uh, the social democracy is, is, is um, um, one of the few political movements who is bilingual and trying to bridge this this, uh, this gap, and uh, so there is a kind of cosmopolitanism, cosmopolitanism from below, also in the other cities, but it's not, at, in, at the end it's not successful, in the 20th century it's not successful, and it's uh, um, just um, erased. Thank you for that question. Uh, yeah, it's usually a good compliment to the lecturer when uh, <laughs> we should stop, not because of like or comments uh, or impression, but only because of time. Um, yeah, and uh, we mentioned more, more than one many times today. And I just uh, remember one uh, diary of a uh, lawyer, lawyer from Odessa. This diary was published in New York in the early, early 20s. He moved uh, 
to the U.S. a few decades and, uh, earlier, and he wrote that Galician Jews uh, should move to Vienna to make some cultural or uh, other uh, uh, career. That German Jews should move to Berlin to make a, to, to become a politician, but uh, Odessa Jews should just move from Moldavanka to the city center to become all of these uh, kind of uh, people. And uh, I think it's a good uh, em uh, way to emphasize how important was this city for uh, empire, this re uh, region, and uh, uh, Jewish and other populations of uh, Eastern Europe at that time. Uh, yeah, I want to uh, ask you to, give, uh, <coughs> to thank Francis. Uh,